Last uh, Sunday, I introduced uh, the five solas uh, or slogans that became the battle cries birthed uh, during the Reformation. Uh, my intention last Sunday to make it through all five of them, but uh, we only made it through the first three. And so today we're going to attempt to finish, Lord willing. So uh, this is uh, Echoes of the Reformation Part 2. If you uh, were not able to be here and you would like to listen to Part 1 in order to catch up with us, um, just speak to our church secretary, Sister Sandy, and maybe you can obtain a copy of the CD, or it may be on the website by now, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe you can go to the website and listen to the cast. Um, so uh, we're going to go back to our text uh, two scriptures that were very prominent uh, as foundational uh, texts for the Reformation, and that's Romans 1 and verse 17. Romans 1 and verse 17. If you're there, shout amen. amen. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Then we read in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 says this For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Pray with me. Father, thank you, Lord, as we come to your word, as we've read these texts, as we've pondered, Lord, the Reformation. I ask for your help in delivering the truths taken from these scriptures and taken from this uh, time in history. Lord, uh, use my lips to speak through them, your words, our minds, think with them, our hearts, just uh, continue to set them aflame with the love for you and the love for all people. In Jesus' name we pray, all God's people shout, Amen. God bless you, you can be seated. We are visiting this historic yet relevant topic because... The Protestant Reformation began 500 years ago this past Tuesday, the 31st of October. The question some are asking is whether or not that event um, is just a relic of history that can be forgotten about, or um, they're asking what was its intended purposes and what makes it relevant to our lives today as followers of Christ. Uh, and so I want to suggest that now more than ever before, well, wouldn't you like to experience a fresh revival and fresh reformation in our nation? May God grant that prayer. Uh, author Robert Godfrey, he put it like this. He said, the Reformation is not a museum to be visited occasionally on a tour bus. It was and is a vital movement for truth and life in the church of Jesus Christ. And so the five uh, sayings or slogans birthed in the Reformation uh, summarize the key doctrinal distinctives between uh, Catholic and Protestant churches. Uh, so we talked about in Scripture alone by grace alone, through faith alone. And now we're coming to the last two because of Christ alone, uh, for the glory of God alone. Let me recap. Uh, we, we talked about it in Scripture alone. Um, I, I was thinking this week how we must live a Scripture alone kind of life. Uh, that is Scripture over us, Scripture under us, Scripture through us, and, and I see this because Scripture over us means we submit to the Scripture. Uh, that's the issue of authority. Scripture under us means we stand on the Scripture. That's the issue of trust. 
Scripture in us means we meditate on Scripture. This is the issue of transformation. And then Scripture through us means we then live out the Scripture. That's the issue of obedience. So the Scriptures must be over, under, in, and lived out through us. Amen? Let's go to grace alone now. We said grace can be defined as God's favor toward the unworthy or God's benevolence on the undeserving. Our text in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 proclaims that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, not of our works or own efforts. Christ wants us to fully understand that works don't work if they're our foundation. And a focus solely on externals is ultimately empty. It's exhausting. When Ulrich Zwingli was uh, serving in Switzerland in ministry, he, he began to break with tradition from the Roman Catholic practice. He began to preach uh, in expository fashion, going through different books of the Bible and uh, he began to do so in the uh, German vernacular of the people, spending six years teaching straight through the New Testament. And this giant of the Reformation took his clues from Christ because he was particularly indignant about the, the pomp and the hypocrisy and the idolatry of man-made religion. And so he labored to free the people from the burdens imposed by the religious leaders by calling folks back to the true grace of God alone. And so we mentioned that last week. Now let's move on through faith alone uh, because we said that the heart of the Reformation is that the free gift of salvation is received by grace alone through faith alone. And we we receive Christ by faith, and then we commit to following him. And, and Luther called justification by faith the article, quote, article by which, uh, or by with and by which the church stands. We can't do enough, be good enough for God. Works don't work as the foundation of salvation. If you want to be saved, Acts 16.31 says, you must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And when we focus in Scripture alone, we can see that it's because of Christ alone through faith alone. So that brings us up to the fourth uh, battle cry, Solus Christus, uh, which is because of Christ alone. Now, as we get into this point, uh, how many realize Christ is the exclusive Savior? We live in this, what has been called and uh, coined as the postmodern age. If that term is unfamiliar to you, it simply means that we live in an age in which our culture has largely abandoned uh, the notion of absolute truth. A hundred years ago, most Americans shared a common moral code based to a large degree on the teachings of the Bible. Even people who were not Christians made their moral judgments based largely on what we today call Judeo-Christian tradition. And there was a large consensus uh, that certain things were right, other things were wrong that some things were permitted in society and other things were not permitted. They were forbidden. That shared consensus gave enormous stability to the culture, to the American culture, and allowed us people really from diverse backgrounds, it allowed us, though, to live together in peace. But now... How many's noticed in 2017 that consensus has almost entirely disappeared? 
which is why Americans can't decide how they feel about things like abortion, pornography, adultery, gay rights. In the old days, we didn't debate those issues because our shared value system taught us that it is wrong to kill unborn babies. It taught us that adultery was always immoral. It taught us that homosexuality was always shameful, that pornography corrupts public morality. But today there is simply no widespread agreement on these issues. And if the old time trinity was Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, how many know the new trinity is things like tolerance, diversity, and pluralism? We worship tolerance. We celebrate diversity. We praise pluralism. And woe to the man or woman who dares to speak against that new trinity. But against the prevailing moral relativism of the day, consider the exclusive claims regarding Christ. John 3.16 said he is the only begotten Son of God. Acts 4.12 says, there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. John 14.6, I am the way, not a way, the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to my Father except by me. He is the only mediator, 1 Timothy 2.5, between God and man. For there is one God, one mediator, the man Christ Jesus. Hebrews 10.12, but when this priest had offered for a time, or for all time, one sacrifice for sins, the writer of Hebrews says he sat down at the right hand of God. These are utterly exclusive statements taken right from the New Testament. And let me say frankly that we have no right to water them down. Amen. Folks may choose to reject them or call them narrow-minded or to pass them off as not applying to us today, but how many know the facts remain that Jesus, I said the Jesus of the Bible, is an utterly exclusive Savior. He stands alone, and no one, my friends, can be compared to Him. Praise God. Because let's honestly face the fact that this does fly, this idea flies in the face of contemporary thinking. If we dare proclaim that the Bible really says uh, this about Christ, then we risk being branded a fool, a nut, or worse, they'll call us a narrow-minded fundamentalist. And we could be ostracized, criticized, ridiculed. But however, we have no right to pretend to follow Christ unless we follow the Christ that is really revealed in the New Testament. And he is precisely these, uh, his exclusivity that, that uh, separates him from every other religious leader in the world. I would even say that it is better, at least more honest, to reject Christ altogether than to water down these statements given to us in the Scripture. And in putting the matter this way, I am simply saying that we must come face to face with the strong Jesus of the New Testament. He is not one among many. Picking a Savior is not like going to the supermarket and, and buying a jar of pickles. Do you want dill or sweet? Do you want spears or sliced crunchy jerkins? Huh? We can't afford to be cavalier when our eternal soul is hanging in the balance. 
And all truth is narrow, including the truth about who Jesus is. Because how many agree two plus two still equals four? Not five, not six, or not seven. Jesus is either who the New Testament says he is, or else he is not the Son of God and is in fact simply a mythical creature like the gods of ancient Greece. But listen, some may regard that statement as the height of intolerance, but I would answer, listen, how many would agree that intolerance is not always bad? Huh? Listen, I've flown a few flights, and when I get on an airplane, I want to know that the mechanics who checked it out were intolerant. Hmm? I do not want a mechanic who looks at something and says, ooh, this engine looks like it could explode, but I think it can handle one more flight. Oh, no. Uh Uh-uh. Likewise, I want a doctor who is intolerant of cancer and who doesn't mind hurting my feelings in order to save my life. Of all the disciples, only Peter voiced the correct answer to Christ's question. He said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Good job, Peter. And so to this day, there are still many opinions about who Christ is. Huh? Some think he's just a good man. Others say he was a good teacher. Some say he was just a historic figure. Some call him a mystic, a sage, a, a, a peasant rabbi. But the Bible calls him the Son of God. And this is the only book that this really matters in this world. Hallelujah. There are many spiritual counterfeits in circulation today. Let me mention a few of them. One of them is Christ plus the church. Now, we're talking about Christ alone. This is the notion that you find Jesus simply, many believe that you find Jesus simply by joining a church. And as long as you maintain regular membership, you're fine. People who believe that tend to be loyal supporters of the church, which we do need loyal supporters. Don't get me wrong. But listen, you can't base your hope of heaven on simply church membership. Hello. That's one of the counterfeits that are in circulation today. Another one is is Christ plus water baptism. Many people believe that salvation depends upon water baptism. At the hands of a pastor in the baptistry or in a creek or a lake or an ocean. We're talking about Christ alone. Another counterfeit is is they say Christ plus Mary and the saints. Huh? And many of those folks consciously or unconsciously have added Mary and the saints to their faith in Christ. They they truly believe that they can find God through the veneration of Mary and with the aid of of the saints in worship. This leads to such things as lighting candles and burning incense and making special offerings in the name of an old saint. Christ alone. Another counterfeit is Christ plus good works. And I include this as a counterfeit because it covers everyone who trusts in Christ and also in their good works to get them to heaven. Listen, they know that Jesus must save them, but they also believe that there's something they've got to do to close the deal. Hmm? Against all of this, though, we have the united testimony of the entire New Testament that salvation is... uh, Predicated and, and simple and, and this on the single condition of trusting in Jesus Christ and Him alone as your personal Lord and Savior. And I would stress that it is that little phrase, and Him alone, that trips up a lot of people. Everyone who claims to be a Christian understands that Jesus must play a part in their salvation. But, but just some part is not the same thing as saying we must try, trust in Him alone. 
And, and in fact, those two statements cannot really be harmonized uh, uh, because here's my definition. To trust in Jesus means to trust so completely in him that you are willing to go to hell if Jesus alone cannot save you. It's Jesus and Jesus alone or we're not going to heaven at all. Nothing needs to be added to that statement. Jesus is the prophet we need. We need no other self-proclaimed prophets uh, to reveal God's word or God's will. Jesus is also not only the prophet we need, he is the priest we need. We need no other human priest to mediate God's salvation. Jesus is the king we need. We need no other king. We need no other pope to control our thinking or our living. We need no evangelical guru or cult leader. Jesus alone is the king of the church. Christ is all in all. He is preeminent. He is and he must have first place. There is no number two. Amen. So we wrap up this point by thinking together about Uh, Three or four, let's say four implications of Christ alone. That means, number one, we come directly to Christ without human mediators. That was so important to the Reformation. It was a central implication during the Protestant Reformation. And to this day, many people instinctively doubt that they can come to Jesus on their own. Huh? Huh? That's why they come to pastors or priests or other religious leaders and, and they seek their assistance. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with coming to the I need some help, Pastor. I'm not understanding. But this is. But no spiritual leader can say, You must come to God through me. Huh? Or you can't come at all. Listen, the, the, the most a pastor can do is point people to Jesus huh and that is indeed a noble work but pointing people to Jesus is far different from claiming to be a human mediator of his grace such a claim is nothing short of blasphemy next here's another second implication when Christ died on the cross he completed the work of salvation that's why he cried in John 19:30 it is finished. Huh? That three word phrase is really only one word in the Greek, tetelestai. And archaeologists have found that word on scraps of first century paper that appear to be ancient um, shopping lists when a purchase was completed, the seller would write tetelestai across the paper, which us today would be paid in full. huh? And even so, when Jesus had paid the full price, Hebrews said, for our salvation, he cried, it is finished, and he sat down at the right hand of the Father. Praise God. By his death, he had paid for the sins of the world. Oh, hallelujah. Third implication is saving faith is nothing nothing less than total reliance on Christ alone apart from human works or human effort of any kind. This follows from everything I've said so far because we must trust in Christ alone and that trust must not be a partial trust. It must be a total trust. And in leaning on the Lord, we come to him not claiming any merit of our own or depending on our good works, no matter how wonderful they may seem to us or even to others who know us. Listen, good works may gain us entrance into many glittering places on this earth, but it will not pry the door of heaven open for us. Our fine reputation may win us friends in high places down here, but it will not win for us one friend that we need the most in the highest place. We may win the Nobel Prize for peace or Congressional Medal of Honor. We may be honored and praised and welcomed and serenaded for wonderful things down here on earth. But none of that matters in eternity in the eyes of Almighty God. If we want to gain His attention, we must put our trust in His crucified Son. 
Praise God. And the fourth and final implication is we must preach Christ and not self-improvement. Because apart from Christ, there is no hope of salvation. And here's an important insight. Because apart from God, there is no basis for self-esteem and no sure foundation for self-improvement. Because to speak of becoming a better husband or father or to teach people how to build large income or to overcome their bad habits, to do that without first leading them to Jesus Christ is like rearranging the deck chairs on the sinking Titanic. What's the point of helping people to be more successful as they rush headlong towards eternity without God? When it comes to Jesus, too many people have this hand grenade kind of faith. They think it's just uh, close enough, it's good enough. But can I tell you, we must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only way that we're going to get to heaven. Listen, most of them believe that Jesus, they, they believe in Jesus a little bit, a little bit. They believe in Jesus and something else. But listen, when you scratch under the surface, they don't believe in Jesus alone as the only hope of their salvation. But to believe in him 95% is to be 100% lost. And so let me share with you five words that will take you all the way to heaven. If you take these five words to your heart and make them part of your life, if you will say them and believe them and rest upon them, these five words can take you to heaven when you die. Here they are. Jesus only and only Jesus. Say it with me. Jesus only and only Jesus. You know, there's a bumper sticker that says, if Jesus is the answer, what is the question? Listen, here's my answer. How can we find God? Jesus is the answer. How can we find true peace? Jesus is the answer. How can we have forgiveness of our sins? Jesus is still the answer. Who can give me new life when I need it? Jesus is still the answer. Who can open the doors of heaven and let me in? Only Jesus and Jesus only. How can I get rid of my guilt when I've sinned? Jesus is the answer. Who can save a sinner like I was? Jesus is the answer. Who can put your life together? Jesus is the answer. Raise your hands and praise Him. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Jesus is the answer to the deepest questions of life. And if you're here this morning and you want to meet Jesus, you have to run to the cross. Oh, hallelujah. Lay hold of that bloody cross of the Son of God. And don't you let it go. If you want your questions answered, if you, if you want your sins forgiven, if you want to be sure of heaven, then go to Jesus. Go to Jesus. Because he was the one that became our substitute by taking our place of punishment on the cross. God the Father is just and therefore demands payment for our sins. And because he is the God of grace, thank God he provided a Savior who shed his blood as full payment, full payment for our sins. He is just and the justifier of those who place their faith in him. If we don't hold to the authority of Scripture, we won't hold to the authority of the Savior. Sola Scriptura leads to Sola Christus. Scripture alone, Christ alone. 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We see that Christ died for our sake by taking our place. And as our representative, he took all of our sins collectively upon him. Think about that, church. Becoming our substitute. Isaiah 53. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He took our penalty. God the Father poured out the wrath we deserved for our sins upon His Son. 
He was our sacrifice. He died so that we might live. And if that were all that he did, it would be more than enough. But he did even more than that. All, think of this, all the righteousness of Christ is now and can now be imputed or deposited or credited into our account. Theologians call this the great exchange. He took our place and our penalty and gave us his position of right standing uh, with God the Father. This is called the doctrine of imputation. They call it that. That's a term in the banking world. It means that when we trust Christ, our sin is credited to Christ's account. His righteousness is credited to our account. What a transition. What a, uh, what a great deal. He takes our debt and we get his credit credit. I said he takes our debt and we get his credit. He paid what we owed and could never pay and he gives us what he has and we could never ever earn it. Thank you Jesus. Here's the very helpful equation. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. I said Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Thank you Lord. Oh, my goodness, here we are again, running out of time. Okay, i got to hurry. Here we go, the last one. For the glory of God alone. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether you eat, drink, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Now, it's so easy to be religious and yet not have a relationship with the living God. Do you know that? You can be religious here this morning and not have a relationship. The Reformation eliminated the dividing line between the secular, excuse me, the sacred and the secular, arguing that all of life is to be lived under the Lordship of Christ, not just the hours you spend in church. Hello. Newsflash, life is not about us. I mean, no, he's God and we are not. And our purpose in life is not to gain popularity or possessions or garner pleasure. The goal of life is to give God the glory alone, to live our lives in such a way that he is pleased and that others are drawn to him through us. And the Reformation is not just a bit of history that we can move on from. It is not principally a negative movement, but a positive reclaiming of the gospel. Because during the Middle Ages, there was a clear distinction between the clergy and the laity. But Luther reinforced the priesthood of all believers and concluded that all work, even the most mundane, could be done for the glory of God. He said the plowboy out working in the fields could do that work to the glory of God. He said the whole world could abound, I quote, with services to the Lord, not only in church, but also in the home, in the kitchen, in the workshop, and in the field. We can, we can all live on mission in the vocation God has called us to. And how do we do our work? How we do our work is a way to worship and a way to witness for Him. And the goal of life is to give God the glory alone to live our lives in such a way that he's pleased and others are being drawn to him. I sort of get it when people say the Bible is God's love letter to us, but how many know it's even more than that? It's the story of the Bible. It's all about the glory of God. Listen, when we get to the last book of the book of Revelation, we're going to find us. We're going to find everything, our crowns being thrown at the, at the very feet of the God of the universe. And we're all just going to be worshiping him. Oh, I said we're all going to be worshiping him. Why? Because it was his glory in the book of Genesis that created everything. And it's His going to be his glory all the way through to Revelation where we're all before him saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Oh, for the glory of God. Isaiah 48, 11 says, I will not give my glory to another. Romans eleven thirty six. 36, for, for of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. And so while Martin Luther nailed the 95 Thesis to the door in Wittenberg, Germany, 500 years ago this past Tuesday, the echoes and the shocks of the Reformation 
I'm glad they're still being heard around the world today. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Sister Jones, if you'll come to the piano. As I close, biographies from the Reformation era, they are very rich in commitment, rich in devotion to the five truths that we have talked about the past two Sundays. For example, I, I recently read about Lady Jane Grey, who became known in history as the teenage martyr. Two days before Lady Jane Grey climbed the scaffold in 1554, the Catholic chaplain, John Freckenham, entered Jane's cell in the Tower of London in hopes, he said, of saving her soul. So he thought. Queen Mary at that time, also known as Bloody Mary, had already signed her cousin Jane's death warrant. But she sent her seasoned chaplain to see if he could woo Lady Jane Grey back to Rome, she put it, before her execution. Jane was about 17 years old. And as that chaplain from Queen Mary entered Jane's cell, a debate followed. He began to press his idea that justification comes by faith and works, doing what the priests and the church leaders say you had to do. But she stood her ground on sola fide, faith alone. He began to assert that the Eucharist bread and wine become the very body and blood of Christ. And she said no. They are only elements symbolizing the body and the blood. He began to affirm that the Catholic Church's authority alongside of Scripture was what mattered. And she insisted that the church, the true church, sits underneath the piercing gaze of God's Word, not beside it. And so he said, I'm sure we, we two shall never meet again. He said that to Jane, implying her damnation. But Jane turned a warning back to him and said, Truth is that we shall never meet again unless God turns your heart. Jane, 17-year-old Jane, spent her final days preparing a brief speech for her execution and sending out some final remarks. On the inside of her Greek New Testament, she wrote this and asked that that New Testament be passed down to her little sister, whose name was Catherine. I quote, she said, This is the book, dear sister, of the law of the Lord. It is in his testament and last will. It is his testament and last will, which he bequeathed unto us wretches which shall lead you to the path of eternal joy. And she said, as touching my death, rejoice as I do, good sis, that I shall be delivered from this corruption and put on incorruption. For I am assured that I shall, for losing of a mortal life, win an immortal one. In the morning of February the 12th, they brought 17-year-old Jane to the wall of the central white tower where a small crowd and an executioner awaited her arrival. Turning to the onlookers, Jane announced and said, I do look to be saved by no other means except by the mercy of God and in the blood of his only son, Jesus Christ. And then she knelt and recited Psalm 51, Have mercy on me, Lord. 
They blindfolded Jane and she felt her way to the execution block as she laid her head in the groove. And the last sound the crowd heard before her passing was her 17-year-old voice saying, Lord, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And so ended the life of a young lady, a teenage martyr, who stood for the truths that we've just talked about. And I read that and I thought, Lady Jane Grey was willing to die for the truths of the Reformation. Are we willing to live for them? As we stand together, maybe you're here this morning and you need a transformation and a reformation in your heart, in your life. I want to let you know Christ can give you a rebirth. Hallelujah. If you repent and ask Him to, you can be born again. If you're already a believer, maybe you've failed in the past. I want to remind you, you don't have to come to pastor. Go to Jesus. Uh, If you want to come to me, I can help you pray. I can point you to Jesus. But he's the one who can forgive your sins and erase your guilt and your shame and give you a peace that passes all understanding when you leave this place this morning. I want us to just end this service. I want us to once again recite the five solas. We said it's in Scripture alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. Father, I don't know the heart condition of those that's here this morning, but Father, may I say something that will take and find lodging in their hearts and lead them, Lord, closer to Christ than they have ever been before. Father, I feel the urgency of the hour. This is not a time to play around. This sanctuary is not a playground. It is a battleground where souls make eternal decisions, ones that will affect their destiny for eternity. And I pray here this morning, just meet us around these altars in Jesus' name. All God's children say amen. Amen. Would you slip out of your seat and come forward? Would you slip out of your seat and come forward and take a few moments? Oh, hallelujah. I feel the presence of the Lord. He'll meet you here. He'll meet you here. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I'm I'm consecrating and dedicating and surrendering myself to you. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. All my hopes and my ambitions. For what he wants for me, all for his glory, I'll take up my cross and follow, wherever he may lead, I'll live my life, for the glory of Christ, for the glory of Christ, I'll lay down everything that I've been given, all my hopes and my for what he wants for me all for his glory I'll take up my cross and follow wherever he may lead I'll live my life for the glory of Christ